Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's ninth meeting of 2019. There are no apologies. Uh, agenda item one is consideration of the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill at stage two. I ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and to the marshalled list of amendments and groupings for this item. I welcome Humza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials. Uh, we now move to formal consideration and I call Amendment 1 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group on its own, Cabinet Secretary, to move and I speak to Amendment 1. Uh, good morning, uh, Convener and Committee, and of course I move the amendment uh, in my name. At the heart of this bill is the reform to require pre-recording in the first instance to have to take place for certain categories of child witnesses in the most serious cases. This new rule in favour of pre-recording is only subject to some narrowly drawn exceptions. The substantial change that this reform, if passed, will bring cannot be underestimated. This has been recognised by this committee with its support for a phased approach to implementation. I'm very grateful to the committee for their understanding and consideration on this point to ensure the reforms are commenced in an appropriate and managed way that does not overwhelm the system. Uh, it's for this reason the list of offences is intended to capture the most serious of cases, but also has a power to add to, to amend, uh, or indeed to remove the list of offences. But I do accept that it may be some time before it's appropriate to use this power, so I was very interested to hear the committee's view on the list as currently set out in the bill, particularly whether it struck the right balance in terms of the offences that were listed. I read the views of the committee in the Stage 1 report with interest in the views of stakeholders who also raised this issue, including the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration, Children First, Scottish Women's Aid, Bernardo Scotland and Assist. I'm very grateful for them all for taking the time to set out their position on this important provision. In particular, powerful evidence was heard about giving evidence in domestic abuse cases and, and that, that this could be particularly distressing for children. I found this testimony to be very persuasive. I also listened carefully as members expressed their opinions during the Stage 1 debate on why domestic abuse should be added to the list of offences that the rule applies to in solemn cases. I found many of your reasons for inclusion compelling, uh, and I was convinced that this was an addition that would really strengthen the reforms in the bill. As indicated at the Stage 1 debate, though, I had to be sure of the impl implications of widening the remit of pre-recording uh, and the implications that could have. This is not something that can be done lightly, as any widening of the rules remit is likely to have major practical uh, and, of course, financial implications. I'm very grateful that members showed that they understood why it was appropriate to carry out further work. Since the Stage 1 evidence sessions, my officials have carried out detailed appraisals uh, of the impact of such an amendment and consulted with justice stakeholders, including, of course, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, to ensure that the implications are given due consideration. There's no denying that such an amendment could have substantial resource implications for the justice sector. Uh, I remember Daniel Johnson specifically asking and making a request during the debate for the number of cases in High Court uh, and Sheriff uh, and Jury that may involve a child witness. Uh, we've projected that the number of cases where a child may be called involving a domestic abuse offence is likely to be approximately 43 cases in the High Court and around 203 uh, in Sheriff and Jury cases per year. Perhaps even more, as this can only be a rough estimate, and of course we need to see what effect the new domestic abuse legislation will have on case numbers over the coming years. Indeed, it's very relevant that the committee is considering this amendment today, as we're now less than three weeks away from that new act commencing. However, despite these significant implications, it's important that we take progressive action to improve the experience of child witnesses in domestic abuse solemn cases. This addition is an ambitious step, but as I say, I think many of you uh, here today have put forward a compelling case for its, con its, its inclusion. Uh, once again, I want to put uh, on the record my thanks to all of the members of the committee for raising this issue, all the stakeholders who contributed uh, and recommending as a committee uh, what is a significant addition to the bill, but clearly a very important one. That's why I'm very pleased uh, to have been able to bring forward uh, this amendment and uh, move Amendment 1 in my name. Uh, Lee MacArthur. Thank you very much. Uh, Convener, and thank you um, very much to the Cabinet Secretary for his comments. I think he's, he's um, very fairly summed up the, the conclusion the committee had, had 
got to, and I think we all recognise the, um, the, the, the resource implications, the pressures that um, this sort of amendment might uh, place on the, the justice system. I, I think I would be interested, certainly, on um, getting a, a bit of a better understanding where those pressures are, are likely to fall, what additional resources um, the government may um, need to put in place to ensure um, that, as a, as a result, there are not knock-on implications for uh, other uh, other cases. But I very much welcome the, the move that the Cabinet Secretary has taken in bringing forward this amendment and certainly will be supporting it. Daniel Johnson. Um, I'd just be brief, and again, I'd, I'd echo very much what Liam MacArthur has just said. Uh, during the Stage 1 debate, there was considerable discussion as to the merits of extending these provisions in the, uh, the Act to uh, uh, summary uh, procedure, and I think we all are, are very mindful of not uh, overwhelming the system with going too far too quickly. But uh, with that in mind, and also given that these measures are open uh, to be used uh, under summary procedure. I'm just wondering if the Cabinet Secretary had given any consideration to non-legislative measures that might be possible to extend to encourage uh, their, their use where appropriate, in particular uh, in, in domestic abuse cases, but anywhere where there may be vulnerable witnesses giving evidence uh, under summary procedure. Convener, um, I, I welcome this, and I'm just, if I could make a general comment, and that is, I, I know the frustration often felt by um, opposition MSPs in respect of legislation brought forward by the government and, and the response, um, or sometimes felt a, a not particularly positive response to the Stage 1 report. I think this is a, a good example of the process working, and I, that's not intended in any way as a criticism of the government, because when the Cabinet Secretary talks about the implications and, um, um, and the ongoing consultation, which I, I think is important, um, it shows that we can make a recommendation, but it can have wider implications. So um, I, I very much welcome this and will be supporting it. Fulton McGregor. Uh, thanks, um, good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary and panel. Uh, I'll be very brief as well. I just want to say that I, I very much welcome uh, this amendment and its credit to the Cabinet Secretary and the, the, the Government for taking on board um, what was said by stakeholders and by ourselves at the, at the Stage 1 uh, level. And I think that it's a, a, an absolutely you know, fantastic uh, amendment to put in place. I just wonder that if the Cabinet Secretary could, in summing up, uh, reflect if any of the, the research done by, by his officials um, it highlighted anything around the numbers of, of children that might, that might now go forward as a witness uh, in a case, as opposed to if the, if the, if the, if the, the legislation hadn't been there. Yes. Um, I think we all um, very much welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has taken account of her recommendation in the Stage 1 report and um, the committee thought about this and, and um, we are all in agreement that it should be extended to domestic abuse in solemn cases as a, a way of still addressing the issue but managing it in a way that it wouldn't impact on the phased approach which was looking at getting it absolutely right at every stage of um, every stage of the, the process uh, and although the cabinet secretary 43 high care high court cases 203 jury and sheriffs then there's by no means any guarantee there would be child witnesses within that so um, Fulton McGregor's point is, is, is one that would be interesting to hear the cabinet's comments on uh, Cabinet Secretary to wind up. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the comments uh, and, and, and the feedback. Um, I don't have uh, all the detail on, on um, the, the, the research uh, behind the, the numbers that I quoted, the 43 cases uh, in the High Court and the 203 in Sheriff uh, and Judy. Um, but I can come back to the committee uh, with some detail if they're, they're interested. Important to say these are projections and estimates as opposed to uh, exact figures, of course. Uh, I do make that really important caveat around the new domestic abuse uh, offence. Um, in terms of, of, of a couple of other comments that, that have been raised, um, the cost, again, uh, I put the caveat on that this is uh, an estimated cost, but the estimated cost of, of adding domestic abuse to a list of offences uh, of solemn cases uh, could increase the recurring cost of the bill of up to approximately 1.3 uh, million per uh, year. Uh, in terms of, of the, the, what that means for, for, for the finances of this bill, uh, as clear in the, the financial memorandum, uh, these reforms um, are expensive to implement, but they are so important, as, as the committee and stakeholders have already said, that these costs, I think, 
uh, can absolutely be uh, justified. Um, if this bill uh, ultimately is passed, we'll continue to monitor the financial implications uh, of these changes and, of course, um, engage freely with our justice sector partners about funding requirements they may have, particularly, as I, I suspect, um, on the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service and the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service. Um, the ongoing requirements arising out of this bill, uh, of course, will be considered uh, in the next uh, spending review. Of course. I'm very grateful, and that's a, a helpful clarification. I, mean, I, I accept that uh, it may be difficult to put precise figures on it, but um, can the Cabinet Secretary perhaps uh, assure the committee that uh, ahead of stage three we may see a, a, a revised financial memorandum trying to um, firm up some of those figures as, as, as far as is possible at this stage? Yes, I'd be happy to explore that. Uh, of course, with any uh, amendment uh, amendments uh, coming forward at this stage, we'll have to look at the financial implications of that and uh, how that affects the uh, financial uh, memorandum. And I think the points that Daniel Johnson made, I, I, I don't have anything really to add other than um, he's absolutely right. We know that the, the, the special measures that we have in place uh, at the moment um, are not perhaps being used at the fullest, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done to encourage um, th uh, the use of those special measures, particularly for our most uh, vulnerable. So, uh, again, I'm happy to take the conversation uh, offline with Daniel Johnson uh, or, or even indeed formally with the committee if they wish uh, in relation to what more can be done that is not legislative to make sure that the uh, uh, the pickup of, of special measures is greater than, than, than is currently the case. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Call Amendment 2 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendment 5. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 2 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you. Uh, convener, this amendment, the amendments in this group are both of a technical nature. I won't lie, I had to ask my officials a couple of times to, to go over the technical detail uh, of them to, to fully grasp it. The amendment two is a technical amendment to ensure that two sets of provisions contained in the bill function properly in relation to each other. Uh, the new rule in favour of pre-recording and the simplified notification procedure for standard special measures. Uh, Section 271D uh, of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 enables the court at any time, up to and including when a vulnerable witness is giving evidence, to review the arrangements for the giving of their evidence at the request of any party to the proceedings uh, or of its own accord. The bill modifies this review provision for cases where the new pre-recording requirement applies. These modifications are necessary so that the exercise of any review in such cases is applied consistently with that pre-recording requirement. The bill also modifies 271D to allow the court to review the arrangements for taking a vulnerable witness's evidence where the arrangements were the result of the new simplified procedure for requesting standard special measures administratively, so were not authorised by court order. Uh, this is what the subsection 4A referred to in this amendment does. However, the simplified notification procedure does not apply in cases to which the new pre-recording requirement applies. This is because taking evidence on commission requires a judge or sheriff to be appointed as commissioner. A commission hearing to be set uh, and a ground rules hearing to be set and conducted uh, matters which need to be dealt with through court orders. So I'm proposing a, a simple technical uh, amendment in order to remove the modification of the review provisions which relate to the simplified uh, notification procedure from the version uh, of section uh, 271D which will apply to cases falling within the new pre-recording requirement. Uh, turning to Amendment 5, uh, this amendment addresses an anomaly uh, in the bill as introduced. Uh, as the committee is aware, even though standard special measures are an automatic entitlement for children and deemed vulnerable witnesses, the sheriff or judge still has to authorise the use of these measures. This is required even though the other party cannot object. So section 6 of the bill simplifies the procedure for seeking standard special measures for child witnesses or deemed uh, vulnerable witnesses. Uh, I'm grateful to the committee for welcoming the reforms to streamline the process in your stage 1 report. The policy intent was always that the simplified procedure should be available for all child witnesses entitled to standard special measures. Uh, this would have included the child accused, uh, but the bill inadvertently did not contain appropriate technical mo modifications to facilitate this. The standard special measure for child accused are live TV link, uh, a supporter, uh, but not uh, screens. Amendment 5 provides for appropriate technical adjustments to ensure that the same administrative procedure for requesting standard special measures can apply seamlessly to a child accused in the future as it will for other child and 
deemed vulnerable witnesses. The bill does not apply the pre-recording rule to the child accused, as that would uh, raise complex issues about the interaction with the accused's right to silence. Uh, there is, however, no justification for treating a child accused application for standard special measures any differently uh, from that of any other child witness in a situation uh, outside the new rule in terms of procedure. Uh, we consider that simplifying the procedure for standard special measures should also benefit a child accused. Uh, it would, of course, still be for the defence to consult with a client on the most appropriate special measure if they choose to give evidence. And I move Amendment 2 uh, in my name. Any comments from members? In that case, the question is Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Ah, okay, thank you. Call Amendment 3 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and a group on its own. Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 3. Thank you, Convener. Uh, if any legislation proposing reforms to our criminal justice system, uh, it, is, it is always important that we strike uh, the right balance. The intention behind this bill is, of course, to support vulnerable witnesses better, both to reduce the potential impact upon them uh, and help them give their best evidence in the interests of justice. But we're clear that this can and must be done while securing the right to a fair trial. Uh, that is why I have been keen to emphasise that it is not our intention that the pr provisions within the bill should limit or indeed prevent cross-examination. We do not consider the bill does this or affects the necessary safeguards. It simply but importantly requires that the evidence of many more of our most vulnerable witnesses to be pre-recorded in advance of trial. I have, however, listened to concerns expressed during stage one from many important voices, excuse me, in the legal sector, that the bill's reforms could potentially enable the use of a prior statement as a witness's only evidence in circumstances where other parties wish to cross-examine that witness. This could potentially have the effect, for example, of preventing a defence representative from questioning the witness. The committee quite rightly raised these concerns in its stage one report and asked what steps the Scottish Government intends to take to address these concerns. Well, we don't agree with the view expressed on the effect that the bill's provision could have in this regard. It's clear that there is a very genuine concern and therefore we need to do what we can to allay uh, those concerns. We consider the best approach was to put this matter beyond doubt in the bill. Uh, we could have added a clarifying provision to the bill to confirm that none of the bill's provisions preclude the right uh, of the other party to cross-examine the witness. But there could have been an unintended consequence with that approach, uh, as the right to cross-examine is not uh, and has not needed to be set out in legislation. It has always been accepted that uh, it is needed for a fair trial. So such an amendment could potentially have cast out on other areas where the right to cross-examine has simply been assumed and nothing, and nothing explicit uh, has ever been said about preserving it. So instead, this amendment proposes a slightly different approach, uh, one which we consider has the same effect. It creates an appropriate mechanism which parties can use to require a commission to be held in cases where the court had originally decided to solely admit a prior statement as that witness's evidence. So it enables any party to the proceedings to have the court authorise the holding of a commission. A party to the proceedings may have a commission set up for them to conduct their cross-examination of the witness. For example, take the situation where a child has already given evidence in the form of a prior statement and further evidence uh, comes to light at a later stage. Uh, the remedy is for a party who needs to cross-examine the child witness to seek a review of the order authorising the use of that special measure of prior statement alone and to request a commission hearing. The amendment requires the court to authorise taking evidence by commissioner, which will enable the child to be cross-examined. I am grateful to all those who gave evidence in writing uh, and to the committee on this issue and to the committee for its consideration. It is important that we continue to have wide support for the pre-recording rule and this proposed amendment uh, should give the reassurance necessary to deal with the concerns raised. Uh, indeed, we have consulted with representatives of the Faculty of Advocates uh, and they have confirmed that the Faculty is content uh, with this proposed amendment. I therefore uh, move Amendment 3 uh, in my name. The question is, amendment. Do members have any comments? Um, do members have any comments? I looked around and I didn't see anyone indicated, so I assumed not. <laughs> okay. The question is that amendment three be agreed. Are we all agreed? agreed? We are agreed. The question is that section one be agreed. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that sections two to four be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. Thank you. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Liam Kerr and the group on its own. Liam Kerr to move and speak to Amendment 4. Thank you, Convener. 
Uh, so this amendment makes clear that the Commissioner has power to take steps to protect vulnerable witnesses after the conclusion of proceedings. The effect of the amendment is that only where this special measure is presided over uh, by a Commissioner, the Commissioner must consider whether the witness will participate in the proceedings more effectively if they are assured of protection after the conclusion of the proceedings. In my view, the justice system has to recognise that although the, the formal process of evidence may be over, victims and other vulnerable witnesses may require further protection and support going forward. Uh, my view on the amendment is that this is only adding to the powers available to commissioners if they deem that the steps could reasonably be taken. So it doesn't mandate action as such or, or place an overly burdensome duty upon them. Now, since filing the amendment, I have received the very helpful comments of Lady Dorian uh, in regard to uh, this and other proposed amendments. And so if the Cabinet Secretary is opposed to this amendment, I would ask that in replying he set out what work the Victims Task Force is taking to support and protect vulnerable witnesses after the conclusion of proceedings, including both their mental and physical well-being. And I move Amendment 4 in my name. Any comments? Uh, Daniel Johnson. Um, I, 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 I thank the convener. Um, I, I just I had a, a brief comment. I think this uh, is a, an interesting amendment because I think while I think there is broad agreement that the sections regarding um, uh, taking evidence by commission and in terms of the, the requirements for that are uh, uh, measured and, and reasonable, I think there are some concerns about whether or not the, a number of the provisions are go, go far enough in terms of uh, proactively uh, seeking assurances that, that uh, vulnerable witnesses are supported through the process, have uh, con continuity of contact, um, and are supported in the way that they need to be. Um, so I bear in mind very much what Lady Dorian has said, but I think there, there does remain, uh, and I wouldn't put it as, as significantly the concerns, but it's certainly question marks as to whether or not there is requirement to maybe look at whether or not some of those requirements and considerations are put on a more proactive basis rather than a, 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 a passive one. So while I won't be supporting the amendment, I, I, I will be abstaining uh, with the purpose uh, or the hope that the government does go and, and consider whether or not there is the possibility of improving some of these provisions. In MacArthur, followed by John Finney. Thank you, convener, I, and I'm grateful to Liam Kerr for setting out the, the, um, the, the purpose behind uh, the amendment. I think he's absolutely right in terms of um, concerns that we heard through stage one in terms of that, I think as Daniel Johnson put, put it, the continuity of, of contact. Um, I, I think, however, Lady Dorian makes uh, a, a very important point about um, the suitability of such an amendment in this, uh, in this sort of bill. So while I listen uh, very carefully to what the Cabinet Secretary says in terms of the work of the Victims Task Force, which I think is probably where this is best, uh, best addressed and addressed it, it needs to be, um, I, I can't support the amendment as it currently stands for, for the arguments, uh, for the reasons set out by Lady Dorian. John Finney. Um, thank you. Um, I have a great deal of sympathy for what Liam Kerr says there, and, and uh, but also would adopt the same position as, as Liam MacArthur. Um, I, I think it's quite evident that throughout the process from engagement with the, the police and social work services through the court proceedings that uh, there's a lot of support provided. I think certainly from casework it, it's apparent that that can tail off and it is that there can be a lasting legacy, particularly in some communities, communities of interest or communities, geographic communities. So it, likewise, I'll be very keen to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say about the Victims Task Force. Thank you. Yeah. Fulton McGregor. Um, similar to what others have said, um, um, I, I, I won't be supporting the, the amendment, but I do have uh, some sympathy with it. In stage one, I, I raised uh, the case of a, a, a child witness. Um, where there was a perceived lack of support, but I don't think this bill is 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 the place to uh, to put to put this into legislation. I think it's more uh, a practice thing, and I think from even from the, the summing up remarks from the, the cabinet secretary and the, the stage one debate, um, I, I feel that that's something that, that will be moved forward. Uh, well, I too very much welcome the fact that uh, Liam Kerr has tabled this amendment. It's a very real issue, um, the fact that there is support for the, the witness and their family prior to and during trial, but not after trial, where there can be very real precautions. And I know this is something the Cabinet uh, Secretary recognises, especially in closed communities or a rural setting. So um, 
uh, I'm pleased that this has been tabled to allow uh, you to respond to this, Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Can I thank Liam uh, Kerr for raising this issue and bringing forward this amendment? Now, the government will be resisting it for, for many of the, the, the reasons that other members uh, have mentioned here. But like all the other members here, we also really appreciate the intent behind uh, the amendment raised by uh, brought forward by, by, by Liam Kerr. Um, I, I mentioned um, on, 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 on the 8th of January when this issue was raised um, by the convener to me that we often talk about, about through care uh, for, for the prisoner. And it struck me uh, early on in the role of Cabinet Secretary for Justice that it's really uh, important that we also consider through care for victims and, and others. Because um, from John Finney's uh, experience in, in, in a previous uh, role, uh, with all the engagement that I have had with victims, and I don't doubt that uh, members on this table have had with victims, they often feel that at the end of a trial, if they have to go through that really difficult ordeal, that the level of support available to them uh, really does tail off. Uh, and, and, and um, you know, that is not the end of the experience for them by, by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes the shock of receiving, for example, a letter telling them that uh, the, the, the person who was accused and, and committed a crime uh, will be on uh, uh, first grant of temporary release or indeed uh, will have a parole hearing uh, can come quite a, a number of years after a trial took place. Uh, and therefore the need for support is, is vitally uh, important. I also acknowledge uh, what you say, Convener, uh, and John Finney made this point too, that there are real issues around closed communities as well as uh, the differences in urban versus uh, rural uh, geographies and settings uh, as well. So a lot, of, a lot of the work we've done on, on, on supporting victims is underpinned by the Victim and Witnesses uh, Act 2014. Um, they include, of course, the right of the victim to be protected during and importantly after a uh, criminal investigation and the requirement for the police to carry out an individual assessment of a victim's need uh, in terms of a variety of factors, including the, the risk of repeat victimisation and intimidation. These are set out in, in the Victims uh, Code. Uh, however, uh, members are absolutely right that um, one of the core remits of the Victims Task Force will be looking at this very issue to improve support, advice and information for victims and witnesses uh, of a crime at all stages of the criminal justice system. And that also includes what happens, for example, uh, if somebody has to go through a trial process. Uh, this will include looking at the information and support that's available to both child and vulnerable witnesses. Uh, the Victim Task Force will also look at how we can improve end-to-end -end support for victims and witnesses throughout the entire criminal justice system, and as I say, beyond. Uh, this will include ensuring victims and witnesses feel safe from any threat of harassment, victimisation or intimidation, uh, for example, after the conclusion of a trial or when an offender is due to be released from prison, bearing in mind this could be years after the initial trial has taken place. Uh, a key focus for the Victims Task Force uh, is to drive forward work to develop a new victim-centred uh, or single point of contact approach to support victims and witnesses at every stage, because we know that many victims have told us that retelling their story is effectively re-traumatising uh, them. This work will be led by uh, Victim Support Scotland in collaboration with task force members. Uh, a report setting out further details of the victim-centred approach will be published this spring, uh, and of course we can ensure that it is sent to the convener for the, for the committee uh, more uh, widely. Um, I, I won't rehearse the, the objections to the amendment, because I think Lady Dorian, who's been referenced by many members here, uh, can of course articulate that far better uh, than I can. But um, well, uh, I think everybody recognises, including Lady Dorian in her letter, the good intent, uh, this bill would not be the right place uh, for it. And indeed, it wouldn't be the remit necessarily of the courts uh, to look at that end uh, to end support. But all that being said, I, I once again reiterate that uh, uh, Liam Kerr's uh, amendment, um, while not supporting it, it raises some very, very important issues. But I can give him and the wider committee uh, hope. Uh, some real reassurances that this is an absolute core uh, uh, part of the remit uh, of, of what the Victims Task Force will be looking into. Liam Kerr to wind up. Press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to all members for their persuasive arguments on this. I, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly points out, I think we can all agree with the principle uh, behind the 
amendment. Uh, and in that regard, I was pleased to hear the Cabinet Secretary's reassurances. Uh, and I would hope that we visibly see evidence of the Victims Task Force taking it on. Uh, and I'm certainly grateful to him for the reassurance that he's made. Uh, Lady Dorian's argument is, of course, well-reasoned uh, and, again, persuasive. And for all these reasons, unless a committee is particularly minded to vote on it, I would withdraw the amendment. Is the committee content that this amendment is withdrawn? Thank you. I call Amendment 6 in my name in a group on its own. I will move and speak to Amendment 6, which seeks to amend the Bill to ensure that parties involved in the taking of evidence by Commission must comply with training requirements relating to questioning vulnerable people. It follows the evidence the Justice Committee heard about the importance of and need for appropriate training for all involved in the process of taking evidence by Commissioner. This should include training judges and sheriffs, as well as prosecution and defence solicitors and advocates involved in both ground rules, hearings and subsequent commission. Amendment 6 is therefore lodged as a probing amendment to facilitate a discussion on what would be required to ensure this appropriate training takes place. Here the committee has, in addition to her formal evidence, received very helpful new comments from Lady Dorian, explaining, for example, that the training cannot and should not be regulated through court rules in an act of a journal. This is because it would interfere with section 24 of the Law Reform Miscellaneous Provisions Scotland Act, which governs the rights of audience of qualified practitioners. Furthermore, to seek to introduce this would have far-reaching consequences for Scots legal practice. More significantly, in terms of this bill, it would be contrary to the collaborative process adopted by the Evidence and Procedure Review Group where professions were fully invested and willing participants. So for, for the purpose of today's discussion and in order to focus on the best possible training measures, it should be recognised and accepted that Scottish ministers will be responsible for the determination and delivery of these matters. Here, the Justice Committee's evidence highlighted the importance of ensuring that training, the training process was tailored to individual needs. In order that witness questioning was carried out appropriately, children first stated all the professionals involved in the forensic interview of children should have the skills and knowledge and sensitivity to elicit best practice without re-traumatisation of the witness. Children First, Social Work Scotland, Police Scotland, NHS Scotland, Psychology Directorate and Victim Support Scotland all emphasised the following. The need for training to be trauma-informed and the need for this training to be sufficiently resourced. I should be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary would address both these crucially important points. Finally, academic research has suggested best practice to improve quali the quality of investigative interviewing of children would be to adopt the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development HICHD protocol training system rather than the traditional structure of focus on the current model used in Scotland. I should therefore be grateful if the Cabinet Secretary would also comment on this protocol and its key recommendations, which are that one, recording interviews is the best way to preserve evidence. Two, it should be explained to children before the substantive interview phase of communication that they are in control of the interview and if they don't know the answer to or don't understand the question, they should say so. Suggestibility, three, and misleading questions should be avoided. Four, an unconnected topic, practice interview, would help to establish a rapport with the child and provide the opportunity to practice open-ended prompts such as describe, how, where. 
and five, monitoring and assessment of training should be carried out periodically, well in advance of, say, a two-year deadline for review to allow improvements to be factored in as training continues and progresses. I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary and other members' comments on these proposals and move Amendment 6 in my name. John Finney. Yeah, thank you, Convener. I, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for what you said. We recently visited uh, the um, Court of Session there to see the training that is available. I, I've often been critical of the training that is delivered and the relevance. I, I think, particularly with regard to this aspect, um, th this is a very challenging, um, for the very reasons you laid out in detail about leading questions in the right um, uh, area and the different... Uh, we know from our visit to, to Norway that all the factors that are considered in terms of the appropriateness of engagement with children, different levels, different ages, different uh, abilities, it seems to me to be quite a complex issue to, to put it in there. Um, uh, so I, I think it very much is, is, is an important issue and, and, and a foundation stone of if this is going to be successful. Uh, so however, coming here, I'm afraid, though, and that is that Lady Doran does lay out um, some of the reasons why she feels that this isn't the vehicle on which to do it. But it still very much is the case that these matters have to be picked up. So I'll listen intently to what the Cabinet Secretary has to say in them. Daniel Johnson and Th Rona Mackay. Thank you, Commissioner, and, and I thank you for bringing forward this probing amendment because I think it does get to the heart of, I think, what is of fundamental importance is that the the, the way in which children are, are questioned and their evidence is obtained is at the very heart of this. And while these measures, I think, are in the, in the bill are very welcome, it will come down to the way in which advocates and, and judges. Um, put these questions to children. And indeed, I think the, the comment you made towards the end of your uh, opening statement about the need to monitor and encourage best practice, I think is extremely well made. And I do wonder, uh, given the, 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 the proposal in other amendments to have reviews, whether or not some monitoring um, and promotion of best practice might be a way that this could be taken forward at an amendment at, at stage three. So I very much welcome uh, both the issue this raises, its sentiment, um, and I, I do hope this will lead to uh, further developments at stage three. Yep. Thank you. Rhonda Mackay. Thank you, Convener. Yes, just to really to sort of agree with the comments that have gone before, I think it's a very well-intentioned um, amendment, but for the reasons that Lady Dorian outlined, um, I don't think it's, um, it's going to be practical, but um, it's really important. Um, training has to be at the top of the agenda, so I look forward to the Cabinet Secretary's remarks on, on that. Lee MacArthur. Yeah, just finally to, to, to add, I think we've, we've all put down probing amendments to, to bills in the past. I think um, this one serves a, a useful function in terms of uh, underscoring the issue that came through loud and clear, not just from the visit to, to Norway, but the other evidence that we, we took that this bill will only be, only be as good as the, uh, the, the way in which it's delivered by uh, well-trained uh, professionals. And I think it provides an opportunity for the Cabinet Secretary, um, hopefully, to, to underscore that and maybe set out measures that can be taken to ensure that that training uh, does take place as the, as the bill's rolled out. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Kimia. And um, can I agree with uh, all the sentiment uh, that has been expressed by other members? Uh, I think it's very important that um, any questioning of vulnerable witnesses is carried out to the highest standard. Training is very clearly a key element in achieving uh, that outcome. Therefore, I very much welcome uh, the fact that you have raised this issue through your, your, or your probing uh, amendment. Um, this allowed us to focus um, on, on the important role that training has in the question, questioning of witnesses. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of this amendment, uh, um, uh, we can't support them um, and will resist it for, again, the very good reasons that have been mentioned uh, already um, by Lady Dorian and by other members uh, across uh, the committee. Uh, I should say the last meeting that we had of the Victims Task Force was hosted by the Judicial Institute, the, um, the, 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 the agency tasked with training uh, judges and sheriffs. So just to give you a further reassurance uh, that this is a live issue, the training of judges and sheriffs that the Victims Task Force is very much uh, looking at. Um, training for uh, judges and sheriffs, uh, as, I've men as I've mentioned, is for the Judicial Institute and training requirements for solicitors and advocates, uh, of course, by uh, their, their professional bodies. The inclusion of, of training requirements in an act of a journal would therefore be unprecedented uh, and, as Lady Dorian said, inappropriate as it would cut 
uh, across the uh, professional regulatory responsibilities of the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society uh, of Scotland. I know that would not be the convener's uh, intention. Uh, it is not for the court or the Lord President to determine what training is appropriate uh, for advocates or solicitors or to certify uh, an appropriate uh, provider. Um, Amendment 6 could also potentially undermine the principle that once a practitioner has a right of audience, uh, the court cannot refuse to hear uh, him or her. Uh, the amendment could also potentially cut across the role of the Lord Advocate as the independent uh, head of the system of criminal prosecution. As you're aware, the Lord Advocate is a prosecutor uh, in all high court trials. Uh, advocate deputies appear by reason of the commission uh, which he gives them. Uh, it's a matter for the Lord Advocate to decide uh, who he gives uh, for a commission. So the potential amendment could uh, constrain him uh, in, in cases involving evidence before a commissioner. Uh, but again, of course, I understand that's not the intention uh, of the convener uh, in lodging uh, this uh, amendment. Uh, none of my, my comments that I've just made uh, should be taken to suggest that I do not agree uh, on the importance of training in this area, but, uh, but I consider it can be dealt with in a more appropriate and effective uh, way. Perhaps the area uh, that, that can be addressed by would be the, the High Court practice note which came into effect on the 8th of May 2017. Uh, that already provides extensive guidelines for, practi for practitioners for the taking of evidence by commissioner. The practice note also directs practitioner practitioners to the website for the Advocates Gateway, which provides helpful guidance on how to ask appropriate questions depending on the age of a child or indeed a young person. There's also a supplementary practice note which will come into effect in April uh, this year. It contains further detail about the submission of questions in writing and in advance and sets out a protocol for the general approach to be taken. This protocol was agreed by the Crown, the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, the greater use of this procedure will also help to ensure that questioning is appropriate. And therefore, perhaps the four issues that the convener articulated well um, could, could, could be, uh, we, could, we could examine them uh, again uh, once that uh, practice note comes into effect in April 2019. But perhaps an idea would be for uh, us to take away um, what the convener has said, have those conversations with the Crown, the Faculty of Advocates and Law Society of Scotland to ensure those principles uh, are, are, are in some way reflected. Um, in, that, uh, in that note. I think that would be a more appropriate way to address this issue while not undermining the important role uh, of the organisations uh, which have within their remit the training uh, of judges uh, and lawyers. The very last point I'd make uh, that you pressed uh, the government on, uh, convener rightly, was uh, around trauma-informed training. Uh, it's an issue that I find uh, hugely uh, important. Uh, the 2018-19 programme for government includes a commitment to develop an adversity and trauma-informed workforce. Uh, we've announced 1.35 million uh, to launch a national trauma training programme to support the Scottish workforce to respond to psychological trauma. Uh, this trauma will be in line with Transforming Psychological Trauma, the first knowledge and skills framework for the Scottish workforce published last year uh, by the Scottish Government and NHS uh, Education uh, Scotland. So hopefully that will give the convener uh, some uh, reassurance. But again, if I can uh, add to that, I would say that the, uh, the Victims Task Force again uh, has often in its first couple of meetings talked about the need uh, for a trauma-informed uh, approach. Uh, to, 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 to the criminal justice system. Yeah, um, I wonder if you could um, perhaps address the, the specific point on resources, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that um, there was, I think, from all these participants that I read out or people that we heard evidence from, um, very much seeking a reassure, uh, an assurance that this training would be sufficiently resourced. And I wonder at the same time if you could um, perhaps explain how training, uh, how on an ongoing basis you, you, you are assured and, and no training is happening and how the quality or effectiveness of that training is monitored at, at present. Yeah. In, t in terms of, of training, we, we have regular discussions with, with um, Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service uh, and, and, and various agencies uh, related to them, the Judicial Institute, for example. So uh, it's for them to determine what uh, appropriate training uh, is needed for, for, for judges and sheriffs. But we work often closely with them, uh, particularly when new legislation uh, is, is coming into force. An example of that, of course, would be the domestic abuse legislation for which there has been uh, extensive training 
uh, for judges uh, and sheriffs, and that comes uh, undoubtedly with the resource uh, implications. So on specific issues of this, if the Judicial Institute feels that there is a need uh, for, for greater training of, of sheriffs and judges, then of course uh, they can make that representation uh, to, to, to the government. Um, in terms of um, our, our, our overview on this, as I say, I'm always very aware that the government um, has to respect the, the, the independence uh, of our, our judges and sheriffs, but we can, of course, at times be involved uh, in, in this, uh, but we need to be assured to only do so when it's appropriate. It's not something that we would set out uh, in primary legislation. Uh, for example, the Scottish Government hosted a roundtable in February this year, just last month, for NHS Education in Scotland, the Law Society of Scotland, and members of the faculty, academics and indeed other stakeholders from the legal profession to discuss opportunities to develop bespoke trauma-informed training resources for solicitors to count towards um, CPD continued uh, professional development. It's important that training is developed practically uh, like this um, rather than perhaps um, if, if we had an inflexible uh, approach uh, via legislation. So again, hopefully that gives uh, some element of comfort that we have regular dialogue with the Judici Judicial Institute uh, on resources and training needs. Uh, as Cabinet Secretary will appreciate the, the training aspect and the content of that training and the effectiveness of the actual questioning is going to be absolutely key to the success of this uh, bill. So the probing amendment has been very helpful in ruling out um, an act of adjournment as a way of taking this forward. But there still remains the question of the, the protocol, the HICHD protocol, which sets out what seems to be very sensible and um, uh, suggestions from you know, explaining to a child before that they don't have to feel under pressure to, to answer, um, to say if they don't understand, um, say that, ask for more explanation, or if they don't know, simply say that, to avoid the suggestibility and um, leading questions to have more practice and open-ended questions, all germane to getting the best evidence and moving towards the forensic interview. And crucially, monitoring that even a practice interview would be helpful to establish that rapport about an unrelated topic, but just to practice these techniques and put the child at ease and um, crucially monitoring how this training is being carried out. Not just you've done the training, that's it, but you know to see is it being effective. So I wonder if the, the Cabinet Secretary would be prepared to meet with me and maybe discuss this a little bit further to see if there's anything at stage through that we might usefully add to the bill that might help ensure that the very best training is, is carried out. Uh, yes, of course, I'd be, I'd be content to, to, to meet. I'm very happy uh, to, to, to meet my uh, view on this. And I think all the four points that um, you, you articulated uh, would, would make uh, eminent sense. But, and this is where the caveat comes in, is that um, you know the Crown, the Faculty of Advocates, the Law Society of Scotland, I suspect they would be in a much better place to, to, to be able to judge whether or not there would be any um, unintended consequences um, of, of what is being uh, suggested. I think it's important to probably explore that in further detail with those stakeholders. So while, of course, I am happy um, to meet the convener, I may, may also want to just touch base with those stakeholders uh, also to, 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 to gain their view uh, on this issue. But, of course, I'm, I'm more than happy to meet. Yeah, and that's very helpful. And uh, I appreciate, yes, it would be uh, very important also to meet with these stakeholders. Um, I, I propose to withdraw this um, amendment. Do members have any objections? No. no objections. Thank you for that. Therefore, I now call Amendment 7 in my name, group with Amendment 8. I will move amendments, speak, uh, Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group. The bill is silent on the issue of uh, an additional commission or commissions, but it was confirmed at stage one that if new evidence emerged, a further commission hearing could be held, um, could, be, could take place. Amendment 7 is therefore a probing amendment to provide the opportunity to discuss this issue. The amendment provides that while circumstances may occur where an additional commission or commissions are required with a witness. In these circumstances, the court must meet a compelling reasons for doing so test for, taking, uh, for the taking of new evidence. 
academic research and the 1989 Piggott report recommended pre-recorded capture of evidence to ensure children should not be re-victimised by having to give evidence all over again in court. The same principle would apply to additional commission or commissions. Here again, the Lord Justice Clark, Lady Dorian, um, in her additional comments, um, made the very helpful point that whilst there may be some advantage in setting out a new process to allow holding of further commissions hearing or commission hearing, there is or there are significant risks. For example, if there were such provision on the face of the bill, experience suggests that applicants of these would applications for these would rapidly become a routine occurrence. This in turn would undermine two of the bill's central objectives. One to minimise the uncertainty as to when uh, a witness might have to appear and to avoid uh, repeat appearances. It is the judiciary's view, therefore, that there is already sufficient flexibility, both within, um, within current court procedures to allow for such follow-up hearings if it is required. However, it would be helpful to have on the record the Cabinet Secretary's understanding of and comments on the legal basis that currently allows for, where necessary and appropriate, multiple commissions to take place. The committee in its stage one evidence heard that there has not been an instance where new circumstances had arisen to, to give cause for a second commission hearing. Given this, and the aforementioned comments from Lady Dorian, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that it would not be necessary or desirable to include provision for additional commissions on the face of the bill? Amendment 8, also in my name, is in the same grouping as Amendment 7 and focuses on reviewing the impact the bill has, has made on the taking of evidence by uh, child witnesses in commission or commissions in relation to the same proceedings, this to be done up to two years after receiving royal assent and allows the government a year to respond. It's important to stress that whilst the amendment allows for the review of the Act provisions up to two years after royal assent, it may be sensible to establish the effectiveness given the proposed phased approach to adults to carry out this review sometime before the two-year deadline. I should be grateful also, therefore, to hear the Cabinet Secretary's view on whether the review provision should be included on the face of the bill, and I move Amendment 7 in my name. Do members have any comments? John Finney. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm not supportive of, of this provision. I think we heard from Norway that uh, um, a robust system first time around saw that uh, it meant there was no requirement. Um, I think, you, however, you do raise a very valid point, and I think, as ever with justice issues, there's that tension between um, the rights of the complainer and the rights of, of the accused. Um, I take reassurance from the very clear statement from Lady Dorian. It's the judiciary view that there's already sufficient flexibility within current court procedures uh, to allow that aspect, if there were a, a further accusation, to come forward to be dealt with. And, and uh, uh, so I, I, I think both are being met with the proposal as it stands. Um, thank you. John Finney, anyone else would like to comment? No. Fulton. Fulton McGregor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, like John Finney, I, I, I won't be supporting this amendment. Um, convener, I, I think that we need to, as we heard from various evidence, need to limit the, um, the amount of time that, that children are, are re-traumatised. I know, Convener, that's something that, that you raised in, in your opening remarks. But also, importantly, I don't think there's actually in the legislation, anything in the legislation that prevents a second commission taking place if uh, the circumstances require it and I think we need to trust the practitioners who are working with the, uh, the, 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 the children involved to, to make those judgments. Anyone else? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Thank you, Convener, for bringing forward these uh, amendments and the power to hold a second commission as well as the review on the impacts uh, on child witnesses required to give evidence on multiple occasions for the same proceedings. 
I will address the amendments. Uh, in turn, it is very helpful to have the opportunity to address the issue and whether a specific provision is required to enable a second commission. It's important. Uh, it's an important point, uh, and this uh, has been a, a valuable uh, discussion. The policy intent is very clear, uh, and it's very clear that we don't want to have multiple commissions, as that would remove the main benefit for the child or vulnerable witnesses of pre-recording their evidence, and also delay the point at which they could um, they could get the experience over and done with, and of course attempt to move on. Uh, with their lives. But of course, it is necessary that there is a procedure to allow this to happen in the rare circumstances where there is a need to recall the witness for further questioning. I note from the Stage 1 report and comments from many members of this committee that it is accepted that, they, that we need to limit the impact of further questioning. But it is quite right to seek clarification on whether a specific provision on this is required or if the current legislative framework will suffice. In the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report, we advised we would consider further whether a specific provision in the Bill on Second Commissions would be helpful. Uh, we are still of the view that it is not necessary. I am aware that uh, Lady Dorian, as has been mentioned, the Lord Justice Clark, has now written to the Committee to advise that it is the judiciary's view that there is already sufficient flexibility within current court procedures to allow for a follow-up hearing if required. I thought she very helpfully also highlighted the risks in setting out a new process to allow holding uh, of a further commission uh, hearing, in particular that if there was an explicit procedure on the face of the bill, such applications would become routine, which would of course undermine two of the central object objectives um, of the bill. It is possible that the very existence of a separate procedure could act as an encouragement for the applications of further commissions. This is at the heart of the issue that concerns me the most about trying to set out a separate procedure. Uh, the convener also asked about um, our own uh, legal uh, understanding uh, of this. Of course, we uh, align ourselves with what has been said by, by Lady Dorian. Uh, we believe that a uh, second commission could be done by review um, uh, under, under Section 271D, uh, and more than one vulnerable witness notice can be submitted under Section 271A. Therefore, we consider uh, there are already mechanisms the court could use uh, if necessary, uh, to order a second commission uh, in an individual uh, case. In relation to Amendment 8, which is focused on the reviewing of the impact of the Act, but specifically the issue of the impact on child witnesses who have had to give evidence on multiple occasions uh, in relation to the same proceeding. Uh, I understand the rationale, of course, behind this amendment and the good intention behind it. Uh, I agree with the principle that there should be an evaluation of these important reforms as we set out in the implementation plan, which I sent to the committee on the 7th of January, monitoring and evaluation is integral to ensuring that the commencement and rollout of provisions of this bill is undertaken in a managed and effective way. However, despite this, there are a number of issues uh, that mean that I cannot support this amendment at uh, this time. Firstly, the timing. Uh, the amendment requires the commencement of, re of a review process. Two years after royal assent of the bill, we expect that this would be um, approximately June 2021. Uh, under the implementation plan, uh, over this period, we expect to be concluding the first six months evaluation of operation of provision within the High Court. Uh, it would not, for me, make sense to embark upon another evaluation so soon after this, particularly since the new rule would not yet have been rolled out to sheriff and jury cases. I suppose the second issue that I have is around the, the inflexibility. Uh, I accept the convener's point that um, if a child witness is given evidence on multiple occasions uh, in relation to the same proceedings, that is an important factor that we must consider. However, to create an entirely new process to focus the appraisal on this one issue, uh, I think might be disproportionate, particularly since, as Lady Dorian pointed out, uh, there has not been an instant yet, an instance yet where new circumstances had arisen to give cause for a second commission hearing. In any evaluation, there should be close uh, monitoring of a range of other matters, uh, such as the, the, the volume of commissions, the type of cases, as well as how commissions uh, are working operationally to ensure the reforms are having the desired effect and informed decisions about the next stage uh, of, of, of rollout. Furthermore, we would want to evaluate not just the impact of the Act, but aspects of the broader system, such as, for example, the high uh, court practice note. Uh, thirdly, the amendment requires that in preparing this report, there should be consultation with uh, quote-unquote vulnerable witnesses. Uh, While it's important the voices of people who are seeking to support, we are seeking to support, are heard, uh, it's clearly a very sensitive matter. I'm very concerned that a statutory obligation could not only be uh, ineffective, but have unintended consequences 
for the very uh, people we are seeking uh, to protect. Uh, for example, uh, them having to retell uh, their story. Um, uh, in relation uh, with all of that uh, considered, uh, I can see merit, uh, of course, in potentially having a review provision in the bill, which I intend to comment on in the discussions in the next grouping, uh, but a review focusing on multiple commissions, which are very unlikely to be numerous, uh, I think is not the preferred approach. Uh, I, mean, I hope that my comments have given sufficient reassurance on the issue of second commissions to enable you uh, not to press uh, the amendments. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. As I said at the outset, this is a probing amendment. I think it has been useful uh, to get on record that it is the Cabinet Secretary's view, um, which concurs with the judiciary, that there is sufficient flexibility within the current court proceeding to allow such follow-up hearings if they're required without setting it uh, in the face of the bill. And in fact, this would be undesirable and would um, possibly uh, only encourage applications which would not be um, desirable or helpful. And also in um, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, comments, establishing that the six months evaluation, you know, the first of that would be six months and roughly the time when um, you would want to look at commissions and other aspects of the bill. So given all of that, I think that's been a very helpful um, discussion to put on record and uh, with that in mind I do not intend to, to press this I will withdraw are members content for me to do so content. are content thank you uh, the question is that section 5 be agreed to are we all agreed we are agreed thank you call amendment 8 in my name already debated with amendment 7 um, not moved the question is therefore that section six to be uh, to eight be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Um, I call amendment nine in the name of Liam MacArthur, Group. Sorry, Liam Kerr. Sorry, Liam. <laughs> Panicking there, were you? <laughs> name of Liam Kerr, <laughs> Group with amendment ten. Liam Kerr to move amendment nine and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, convener. Uh, so, <clears throat> the Scottish Government has rightly made the point throughout stage one that these reforms must be progressed slowly uh, in order that careful monitoring can take place throughout implementation. Uh, two different groups of vulnerable witnesses in various types of proceedings. And the Cabinet Secretary has just made clear his view that any review must be a wide one, it must be uh, all encompassing. I agree. Uh, which is why this Amendment 9 uh, places that requirement to review the operation of the Act on a more formal basis uh, and on the face of the Act. The report envisaged by the amendment would ensure that the Committee and Parliament can scrutinise these reforms very closely and receive all the information that they require to do so. And I think this will also, uh, when the Cabinet Secretary decides to halt or progress a particular phase or a particular extension, it will give the public confidence uh, that there is an evidence base behind such a move and ensure that the Cabinet Secretary is accountable for that decision. Now, if the Cabinet Secretary is minded to speak against this amendment, and I note in his earlier comments he intends to comment uh, in, in depth on, on these two amendments, uh, I would be grateful for suggestions as to either how the Government uh, pr pr um, proposes to share the progress and results of extension with the committee and or move towards such an outcome at stage three. And I move Amendment 9 in my name. Right, thank you. Uh, I will now speak to Amendment 10 and the other amendment in the group. Amendment 10 is again a probing amendment which focuses on the principle of moving uh, closer to or moving to the Barnahus model. The amendment specifically seeks to ensure that after the bill has received, has received royal assent, there is a review of the progress made by the government and government agencies towards implementing the principles of a Scottish version of the Barnahus model. The committee has been clear that it wanted to see how the collecting of information has evolved 
and what progress has been made towards the one forensic interview on the Barnhouse type model um, before the end of this parliamentary session. I should therefore be grateful to receive the Cabinet Secretary's view on how this objective can be re released, uh, realised. Do members have any comments? Daniel Johnson. Um, I, I'd just like to begin by saying that I, w I welcome both of these amendments. As a general principle, I think um, the, the possibility of embedding the requirement for review into legislation, I think, often makes a great deal of sense. I think it makes a particular sense uh, in this instance, given what is uh, sought uh, through this bill and the change uh, in terms of the way that uh, evidence is gathered and indeed the experience of the courts, uh, which is ultimately the intention of this. So therefore, I think reviewing whether or not it has had this effect and whether indeed um, there are further steps that could be taken following implementation makes a great deal of sense. With that in mind, I think Liam Kerr's uh, amendment, uh, amendment 9 in particular is, is uh, well framed. It is uh, 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 broadly stated, looking at the effect of the Act in general. It is not prescriptive in terms of what that review uh, could contain, giving flexibility regarding the content of that review, and then requires ministers, I think, to uh, uh, respond with consideration to the key agencies and actors involved in terms of the operation of this Act, um, and, and therefore, I think, is uh, well stated. The only concern I, I, I could consider is that three years may be perhaps a little too soon in terms of the operation of, of, of the, the Act for the, 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 the reasons that the Cabinet Secretary set out in his uh, response to the previous set of amendments. However, I, I believe that that is something that could quite easily be remedied in Stage 3. Indeed, if there is additional considerations to be made, I think that this uh, could be amended in Stage 3, and therefore I would urge members to support um, uh, Amendment 9 at this point, and I certainly will be if the member chooses to, to press it. Shona Robson. Um, I have sympathy for the sentiment of, of both the uh, amendments, and I think to, to boil it down, it's an attempt to um, ensure that progress is made and um, that there is a, a time frame, therefore, within which uh, the government would uh, need to demonstrate uh, progress on what are important matters and have received the, the, the support of all members of, of this committee, particularly in relation to um, progress towards uh, a shift to the, the Barnahus uh, model. I guess my question is, uh, is this the only way to uh, achieve that? We'll have to hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say, um, but if the sentiment of these amendments can be achieved in a different way um, and that doesn't require to be uh, on the face of this bill, then I would certainly be sympathetic to that also. I think the most important thing here is achieving progress towards an end that the committee has been unanimous uh, on. Thank you. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks, Commissioner, and I just want to say that I welcome. Uh, your amendment uh, 10 as a, as a proven amendment. I think that many of us raised during um, the stage one debate that the infrastructure uh, is very much already in place. Police and social work joint interviews already take place. Uh, health services are already involved in, um, uh, in assessments. And I think that it would be, it would seem that it could be relatively straightforward to bring out some sort of pilot with a, a one stop shop barn house type of approach and uh, I'd be interested to hear the Cabinet Secretary's remarks on that. I think it was also raised at stage one, but certainly, um, although I, I, I wouldn't vote for it at this stage, I certainly um, welcome it as a proven amendment. Okay. Rona? Yes, thank you. Um, amendment nine, um, again, well intentioned, but um, my worries are, are the re-traumatising aspect of it and that would be why I, I can't support it. Um, and Amendment 10, you know, really happy that it's been brought up and I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's um, views on this because, as Shona Robson said, everyone is, is very supportive of Scotland moving towards the Barna House type model. And um, if it could be done without um, prescriptive legislation in the face of the bill, I look forward to hearing the Cabinet Secretary's views. Okay. Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Convener and Committee, for uh, the remarks. I thank uh, Liam Kerr uh, and uh, Convener for raising the monitoring and evaluation of the Act by lodging these uh, amendments. I understand the rationale behind them. I agree very much with the principles that there should be evaluation of these important reforms. As I said a moment ago, the implementation plan, which I sent to the Committee on the 7th of January, has monitoring and evaluation as an integral part of the phased introduction of the Bill. It is crucial that commencement and rollout of the provisions in the Bill are undertaken in, in a managed uh, and effective uh, way um, so to ensure that the intended benefits are delivered to individuals uh, in the most involved in the most serious uh, of cases. We have only included uh, dates for the first three phases in the draft implementation plan uh, because we must ensure that there is a suitable period of evaluation and monitoring before moving to commence the next stage of implementation. Uh, I intend to update the committee in this monitoring work after, <coughs> excuse me, after it has been completed for each phase uh, and what this evaluation means for moving on to the next plan stage. Uh, I consider that we need to retain flexibility for the timing of these evaluations so it would be not appropriate to set it out in primary legislation. However, that is different from potentially having an overarching provision uh, in the Bill to review and report to this Parliament on how the new pre-recording rule is working in practice. My, my understanding is that this is the intention behind Liam Kerr's amendment, and I can see the merits uh, in such a provision. I'm very much minded uh, in favour of such an addition uh, to the bill. Uh, unfortunately, there are some issues that mean I cannot support uh, this particular uh, amendment at this time, and I will, of course. Uh, I mean, I, I thank him for taking the intervention. So, can I just clarify? Um, if the, the amendment came forward that didn't have a, a, a set time frame or had a longer time frame, would that be acceptable? And, and how long a time frame might he accept? Well, I think there's a number of issues which I was about to come on to with, with the amendment. It's not, not just about the timing, but that is one of the issues. Uh, my suggestion will be that um, I work with those members interested, Liam Kerr and, and other members interested in an overarching uh, review uh, and then see if we can come back with something prior to stage three. So if Daniel Johnson would like to be part of those conversations, uh, of course, I certainly wouldn't have uh, any, any, any objection uh, to that because, in principle, uh, I agree uh, with, with, with the sentiment. But there are some issues, not just uh, about the timing, but I will come to that um, in, in, in particular. Um, uh, in terms of the way that the review provision uh, is drafted, it suggests that any report on the impact of the Act would focus on support and information provided to vulnerable witnesses and detail any new proposals from ministers in this regard. Uh, and so whilst I agree that uh, monitoring and reviewing such information uh, and support is important, uh, I don't think that the proposed report on the operation of the Act uh, is an appropriate vehicle for such a review. The Bill does not actually propose any reforms on providing information to vulnerable witnesses. A statement on the impact of this legislation uh, on such issues is likely to be uh, very limited. But by highlighting this issue in his amendment, Liam Kerr has raised a vitally uh, important matter. A key focus for the Victims Task Force is very much on the development of a victim-centred approach, which includes consideration of support and information materials that are made available to all victims uh, and uh, witnesses. Um, this approach, led by the Task Force, will enable a comprehensive review of information and support. And I think we also uh, have to make sure the statutory review is timed to be as effective uh, as possible uh, after these reforms uh, have had a real chance to make a difference uh, that we all believe that they will. So maybe the review is better to start, perhaps uh, has been suggested, um, three years from the date of commencement of the first phase of the rollout of the pre-recording rule, rather than, for example, from royal assent. Uh, and I emphasise that I consider any statutory review would be in addition to our monitoring of each phase of the rollout and updating the committee, of course, accordingly. Uh, I've already explained in connection uh, with the previous grouping groups of amendments uh, why I think the reference in the current wording to consultation with vulnerable witnesses poses problems. Uh, however, while I consider this amendment doesn't quite have the uh, effect as intended, as I've uh, just said a moment ago, uh, it's a very constructive proposal. Um, if Liam Kerr is willing to, to not press uh, his amendment, then I'd be happy to work with him and indeed any other members to bring forward an amendment at stage three to put on the face of the bill uh, as a formal review act, uh, formal review uh, of the act. Uh, as for uh, amendment 10, uh, can I thank the convener for highlighting the importance of working towards ensuring that uh, children's evidence is taken uh, in a child-centred setting uh, where they can access the wraparound care 
and support that they need. I'm also am very aware of the committee's uh, deep and uh, sincere interest in, in, in the Barnhouse concept. <clears throat> I believe a, a Scottish version of the Barnhouse concept uh, is the very best way to achieve this. And as I said to Parliament on the 5th of February, uh, that is the Scottish Government's uh, intended destination. Uh, I can fully understand why this committee is keen to ensure that progress is made and the evidence that this committee has gathered will very much inform our work going forward. Uh, the issue for consideration today, though, is whether this well-meaning amendment will actually have the effect uh, intended. Uh, in 2015, the, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Services Evidence and Procedure Review produced a comprehensive review of the same process and identified clear areas for action. Uh, this was a detailed process that took a, a number of years. I am not convinced that a government-led review considering the same areas is really necessary or indeed appropriate at this time. Furthermore, introducing a requirement for another wide-ranging review of this process for taking evidence from children will inevitably divert resources from taking forward uh, this important work. In order to meet the requirement as drafted in this amendment, any review would be focused on the way evidence is taken. But as we know, whilst this, um, well, this uh, is an important part of Barnahus, the concept is so much more than that. It's about much more than the type of accommodation where evidence is recorded, uh, even though this is a vital element. It's about the wraparound care uh, and services that are provided to these vulnerable child victims at the earliest opportunity that truly address trauma uh, and promote recovery. So to carry out a, a thorough uh, systematic review, uh, would uh, work would have to begin this parliamentary term. Uh, therefore, the resource that we intend to commit to scoping how Barnhouse could work in Scotland uh, and the development of very Scottish-specific standards um, may have to instead be diverted to undertaking another review on the evidence-taking process, something that has uh, already uh, been done. Uh, this would be on top of the review into the operation of the Act, which I have said in respect to Liam Kerr's amendment, uh, I consider should be added to this legislation. Um, so while I do understand this amendment has been considered uh, as a way to ensure progress is made, I do not consider such a review as the best way uh, to do that, uh, particularly uh, as the report in this review, as I say, would not be required until the next um, parliamentary term. Um, we are committed to taking forward uh, work with stakeholders to consider how the concept would work in Scotland. That's why we've asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland and indeed the Care Inspectorate to develop Scottish-specific standards for Barnahouse based on best practice from Nordic countries. Uh, this work will involve extensive consultation, including with health boards, children's services, the third sector uh, and justice partners, and of course will be informed directly by children uh, and young people's uh, evidence uh, as well and, and, and their thoughts. Um, as I say, I don't believe that this amendment is the best way to achieve that truly uh, child-centred trauma-informed response. I believe the work we are beginning on the Barnahouse concept in Scotland will do that. Instead of supporting this amendment, I would therefore uh, be happy to commit today to providing a formal report to Parliament on progress made on Barnahouse. I also reiterate the undertaking in my letter on the 12th of December to the committee and at the stage one debate on the 5th of February to keep Parliament updated on progress in developing a Scottish approach to Barnahus. Uh, I hope that my comments reassure members of my commitment in this area uh, and we have the opportunity to work together on to how best ensure that progress is made in developing a Scottish approach to Barnahus. I reiterate that I consider uh, this is most likely to be achieved by focusing on making progress rather than committing to yet another review. Uh, on that basis, I would ask the convener not to press this amendment. Liam Kerr to wind up and press or withdraw. Thank you, Convener. Once again, I'm very grateful to members for their thoughts. I thought that was a, an interesting discussion. Uh, in particular, uh, I do take Daniel Johnson's point. I, th I think he's succinctly summarised uh, many of my views in, in bringing this forward in the first place. Uh, I am interested in the point about three years uh, from royal assent being too soon, and I do hear the Cabinet Secretary's point on the implementation plan. I also understand the points that he made about uh, general timing and, and drafting uh, in particular. I think the committee would agree it's crucial we, we get this right, uh, and I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's offer to work together to ensure that outcome before stage three, on which basis, if the committee will indulge me, I shall withdraw the amendment. Okay. Um, do our members content that this um, amendment is withdrawn? You are content. Thank you for that. Um, I call Amendment 10 in my name already debated with Amendment 9 to move or not move. Not moved. Um, we now move on to Amendment 
5 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary, to move formally. I move Amendment 5 in my name. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we, are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The question is that Sections 10 to 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you. The question is the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? Thank you. That ends Stage 2 consideration of the Bill. I thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. The next meeting is on Tuesday 19th of March. We now move into private session. <laughs>